Hey there, my name is Joe Barnard and welcome to the second part of this video where we explain what happened with the Echo vehicle during this test. I have the same one here. I have replaced one of the landing legs because we did indeed break one. Um, so I think the best way to do this is just to go through the sequence of events of the whole test. So let's get started. I have all my flight data set up in a MATLAB plot here and I'll show different parts of it as we go through each part of the test. Before the test, I let the rocket warm up on the ground and I'm not even kidding, I let it warm up. Now, it was obviously a summer day, it was warm outside, but the PCB has a voltage regulator on the back that gets a little bit hot sometimes. So I let it warm up on the ground so that the IMU can auto-calibrate before it's time to actually test, and this makes things a lot more accurate in flight. Then, I went around the test site turning on all the cameras, I put the rocket into its flight mode, and then I had the drone lifted off the ground. You'll notice that the rocket actually hovers in the air and stops ascending for a little bit. That's because there was a bit of an oscillation as the drone was lifting the rocket up and I wanted to let it dampen out for a second. Once the rocket passed 30 meters above ground level, it fired Pyro Channel 1, which is connected to this little nichrome wire right here. Now the nichrome wire heats up and cuts a rubber band connecting the two vehicles together. So once the rubber band is cut, the vehicle is able to just drop from the drone. And once the rocket starts dropping, everything happens really fast. So let's go through all of the events here. As soon as the rocket separates, you'll see the acceleration measurements all go to zero, and that's because the rocket's in free fall at this point. As it descends, the fins on the top of the vehicle keep the rocket passively stable. If it were to tilt this way, these fins would push it back, giving it a restoring force. Same for this axis, too. At 38.6 seconds into the test, the rocket's flight computer decides that it's time to fire the retro motor. It uses Pyro Channel 3 to send a burst of electricity down to this igniter here, which was connected to this motor, which is now spent. At 38.7 seconds, the guidance system becomes active and thrust vector control begins. And then at 38.8 seconds, the retro motor finally comes up to thrust and we begin to slow the rocket's fall. Now at this point, the first problem in our test has already occurred, which is that Signal decided to burn the retro motor just a little bit too late. This can be traced back to some of the code that is used to generate the correct landing burn altitude on the flight computer while the rocket is in flight. Now part of this code accounts for the vehicle's mass. In real life, the actual mass of the rocket was about 1.15 kilograms. The flight computer understood the rocket's mass to be closer to about one kilogram. And this is a problem because there's a mismatch here. I won't get too into the simulation aspect of this or the specifics of why it happened right now. If you are interested in that, you should be subscribed because it's coming out in an episode of Landing Model Rockets. But we're gonna move on understanding that the rocket decided to burn the motor just a little bit too late. As the vehicle slows down, the flight computer commands the landing legs to open at around 39.55 seconds, and at 40.1 seconds, they do. The reason for this delay is that the landing legs are opened by cutting a rubber band with a nichrome wire right here. The nichrome wire takes about a half a second to heat up and cut that rubber band, which is when we see the legs fold out. And if you look really closely, you can actually see the rubber band flying away as the landing legs open up. As the vehicle approaches the ground, we start to see the second major problem in this test which is that the vehicle isn't holding itself completely upright. By not being locked at zero degrees on the X and Y axis, we start to induce some horizontal translation into our flight, so the rocket starts sort of power sliding along. At 41.2 seconds, we see impact number one, where the legs make contact with the ground, and we can see that in the acceleration measurements here. At 41.4 seconds, we see the second impact. That's where the vehicle tips over and hits the ground, knocking off some of these fins up top. And then at 41.6 seconds, we see the final burnout of the retro motor. After burnout, the vehicle lies on the ground for about seven seconds before the rocket detects that it has landed, it decides it's time to stop data logging, and then it moves all of the data from the flash chip to the SD card on the computer. And all of this happens autonomously from this little board. So all in all, while the rocket didn't land standing upright, this is a really successful test. No parachutes were needed to recover the rocket after a 30 meter fall, which is pretty impressive. Obviously, there are a lot of refinements that can be made here, so let's address what some of them are. First and foremost, and really this is why we test, I'm going to use all of this flight data to inform future flight simulations. Every time we have a test where I can get valuable data back, I can feed it back into how I'm simulating things offline and get more accurate results in the future. This is the same phenomenon that you saw with SpaceX when they were trying to land their Falcon 9 booster. It took them a bunch of tries to get it right once, and then as soon as it happened once, it started to happen a lot more often because they could use that existing data to inform future flights. Before the next test, I'd like to incorporate some horizontal motion tracking in the flight computer. So this is tracking things downrange, or really just the power slide that we saw in this flight. That power slide isn't going to work so well if we want to be able to land upright, so canceling that out is going to be an important part of actually making this happen. 
I'd also like to beef up the landing legs a little bit. This isn't a huge priority because these legs are really cheap to manufacture, but it would be good to break less of them, so we're going to try to do that. And as for other next steps, you should stay tuned because we have a new episode of Landing Model Rockets coming out in just a few days. That episode will be available through the Patreon links down below, and then we'll go live on this channel about a week later. The tremendous generosity from the folks supporting BPS on Patreon has allowed projects like this and the Falcon Heavy to really come to life. If you're able to support BPS on Patreon, it is certainly appreciated, but by no means required. Honestly, the most helpful thing you can do to support the project is just share it around. And so with all that said, thank you very much for watching. My name's Joe Barnard, and I will talk to you soon.